Well, good morning. Welcome to another youth service. We're so happy to have you here today. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Our call to worship this morning is out of Psalm 25, and it's only verses 1 through 5, and it says this. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Let's pray. Dear Father, as we give our time to you this morning, we pray that we can trust, that we can worship, and that we can let that worship penetrate into every aspect of our lives, and we're going to see how that works in our sermon today. But Father, I just pray today that we will be able to worship you properly with everything that we have and everything of who we are, Father. So thank you for your grace, and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and begin with a time of singing and praise. Oh, name it is the name 
Praise God for worship. Uh, I want to introduce our sermon this week with uh, something that I want to let you guys know what we're doing. Uh, I, I wasn't sure if we were going to actually follow suit with the English congregation, but what Pastor Eric does is every week he has a, sorry, every month, the last week of the, of the month is dedicated to a topical sermon. And uh, we've been kind of doing that. And so 
I'm going to take this opportunity to follow what Pastor Eric is doing. And instead of continuing through the book of Romans today, we're actually going to take a sidestep um, and to talk about something topical. And for those of you who read the YouTube link <laughs> or the, the title, you know what that topic is. And today we're going to be looking specifically on uh, everyone's favorite topic, uh, I think, and that is the topic of dating. Uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at what are the Christian principles for dating. Today's ser- sermon is titled, what are the, or sorry, it's, it's titled, The Christian Principles of Dating. What are the Christian principles of dating? And every time I give a sermon on dating, it's instantly the most popular sermon that I give all year. Um, we have students that we haven't seen in eight months, and then whenever they hear that, oh, the sermon this week is going to be on dating, and then, of course, everyone shows up. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, the, the rumor spreads around and everyone instantly knows. Um, I'm used to that. And I have to say it's not just youth who are fascinated by the topic of dating, but even college students and young adults, um, everyone's fascinated with dating. In fact, I once took a class when I was in college, and the class was on New Testament theology. And when we sat in class, the first week of class, the teacher gave us the syllabus, and then he told us, 25 weeks of this class will be dedicated to the, uh, the theology of the New Testament. But one magical class <laughs> that he would pick during the semester, one magical class he would choose and have it be just only dating. The entire week would be dedicated to just talking about dating. <laughs> and, you know, there were people who, uh, they didn't show up to class one day the entire semester, but they all showed up to that class. <laughs> so, you know, everyone's interested in dating. Everyone's fascinated by dating, aren't we? And I think the reason that dating is so fascinating, I think, can be explained with this story. Uh, When I was in high school, there was a girl. um, Every girl that I use in my illustration, her name is always Becky. Uh, I've never dated a girl named Becky. I never had a crush on a girl named Becky, I don't think. Um, So my wife, if you're watching this, don't Facebook, who's Becky? (laughs) Don't do that. (laughs) Um, I don't have any Beckys that I ever liked. Um, But let's just say that her name was Becky, right? And I went up and I asked her, you know, first I asked all of, her, all of my friends, do I have a shot? What do you think? And then, you know, is, is, it, is it more than 50%? <laughs> is she going to say yes? What, what percent is she going to say yes? And then once they told me they thought I had a shot, then I went to ask her friends, okay, do you think Becky, your friend, would like me if I asked her on a date? And then, you know, did that whole thing. And finally, eventually, I went to her and I said, hey, um, Becky, I'm the guy for you. And she basically said, sorry, but dad doesn't let me date. (laughs) And so I was like, okay, you know, I turned down uh, a little bit sad, but it wasn't my fault. It's not like I'm gross. It's just she's got a dad who doesn't let her date. Well, a month later, of course, my friend asked her out, and that hussy said yes. (laughs) So, (laughs) um, you know, I think that that's why dating sermons are so popular is because dating, as this story illustrates, is hard. It's incredibly hard. Who can unlock that mystery? Nobody, right? And so given that the Bible is the ultimate source of wisdom, we always hear that some sermon is going to be on dating, and we're instantly hoping that the pastor will uh, give us all of God's secrets on how to make Becky like us, right? <laughs> we, we think that our, the sermon is going to be something like a BuzzFeed article. You know, God says these ten things will help you land a babe. Or <laughs> Number seven will shock you. <laughs> um, I had way too much time making, or t- too much fun making this slide. <laughs> I was going to make it so in- ornate. Um, I had a lot of fun with that. Uh, but that's what we're hoping that dating sermons will be like. But the truth is that the Bible actually doesn't tell us how to make girls like us. It doesn't tell us how to make guys notice us. Uh, the truth is that the Bible doesn't even really say whether we should or shouldn't date at all. There's no rule. Contrary to what many parents like to say, there is no section in Scripture that says, thou shalt not date unless you graduate with a 3.8 GPA and make sure to get home before 7.30 p.m., right? There's no Scripture that says that. And even though the Bible doesn't say much about dating, the truth is that we wish it did. (laughs) We all wish that it did because um, we think about dating. Thinking about dating takes up a considerable portion of our lives. We plan for dating. Dating plays a significant role in what happens in my life in the future. And so dating plays a huge role in, in who I am as a person. I mean, not me, I'm married, <laughs> but you. <laughs> and in fact, uh, we're so into dating, um, it turns out that statistics show that 40% of middle schoolers 
and 70% of high schoolers have had a crush within the last 18 months, and 75% of high school graduates report that they had at least one romantic experience with someone before they graduated high school. So the truth is that even though it's not something that we like to talk about a lot in church, um, well, I don't, it's not that we don't like to, but we just don't. Uh, the truth is that dating pretty much dominates our minds from the age of like 12 until we turn like 170 or something like that. (laughs) Dating is always on our minds. And so we are in need of guidance in dating. We are in need of it. We are in need of guidance from God. And we're very lucky because even though Scripture gives us no commands on whether or not we should actually date, uh, Scripture does give us principles on how to determine how to date, right? It does show us how we should do it. And so let's take a look at some basic principles on how Christians should date you as a youth. If you date, how should you date? And the first thing I want to let you know, how should Christian youth date, is first we need to understand that we need to not stir up love before it's time. Do not stir up love before it's time and in order to explain this principle to you, I'm going to use a story of my wife. Um, now, did my wife stir up love before it's time? I don't think so. <laughs> I'm not sure. She never told me that she did. Um, but what she does do, and, and quite often I might add, is that she, uh, she does do something before it's time. It's not dating, but she does something else. And that, and that is she is willing to eat food that's not ready yet. <laughs> she, she does. Um, my wife tries very hard to cook for me, and it's always very good, and I'm very grateful. Uh, half the time is just delicious. Um, but one thing that absolutely drives me nuts about my wife is that the food, according to her, the food's not done when the food's done. The food is done when she wants it to be done. <laughs> so sometimes you know, she throws spaghetti in there and she leaves it for like 20 minutes. I'm watching it. <laughs> like, she should take it out nine minutes ago. And other times, um, one particularly frightening way that it frightens me uh, is that my wife, every now and then, uh, she's willing to eat food even before it's fully cooked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it just works out that way. Every now and then, she's willing to eat food that's not fully cooked. In fact, every now and then, she'll throw some food in the microwave for me, and then she gives it to me, and then, of course, it's still a little bit frozen or, or cold in the middle. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. We've all had that situation. It's a mistake that's easily fixed by throwing it in the microwave for 20 more seconds. But the last time she cooked for me, it was spaghetti. And uh, I took a bite out of it, and immediately I noticed that it was frozen, like halfway in, in, in the center and um, I immediately told my wife, I, I, the tongue, the coldness of my tongue touched my tongue. And I was like, oh, man, I got to warn my wife. And I looked up in disgust to tell her, wife, don't eat this. It's not done. And she, I saw her munching away, and she's looking at it like, eh, it's all right. <laughs> she just kept eating it. And for those of you who have seen The Princess Bride, <laughs> um, you'll, you'll know what this meme is. It's not done. It's just mostly done. <laughs> from my wife, that's totally okay. She's like that. Um, so I love her. Wife, don't beat me up after this. For those of you who don't know, my wife is a level six black belt. So if I'm bruised next week, <laughs> you know why. Um, but The whole point of me showing this illustration is to show this, that for many things, there is a critical point (laughs) at which we have to understand it's proper to wait until it's ready. (laughs) We have to wait until the proper time. In fact, the book of Ecclesiastes shows us this, doesn't it? Um, This is a a paraphrase, by the way. It says, For everything there is a season, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to re-eat. To eat reheated spaghetti and a time to leave it in the microwave for another 30 seconds. (laughs) This is the Jeff version, Um, but you get the point. But apparently, in all seriousness, Scripture also tells us that there is a time for romance and there is a time for not romance. And this is where let's get serious. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 5, says this, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, Do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Now, if you were to ask me why in the world Solomon was writing about gazelles and deers and mooses and stuff, (laughs) um, I don't know. Uh, Solomon had a really weird way of expressing love towards ladies. (laughs) So, not sure what that means. But what I do know is something that Solomon is understanding in this section. And what he understands is this. 
we have a tendency to go seeking after love, much in the same way that we seek after a highlighter lost in our backpack, right? Uh, we pursue it relentlessly, and we are never satisfied until we find, there it is, I found it, right? We, we seek after it, and why not? Love is a topic of every movie. Every song is dedicated to it. Every art exhibit, every book is about love and dating. There's a whole book of the Bible even dedicated to it, the Song of Solomon. Not dating, but romantic love. And what I want you to notice is, if we can go back to the verse, what I want you to notice is just like my wife's spaghetti. <laughs> Solomon is saying that there is a time when romance as a concept within us is not ready. And seeking it before it's ready can cause us great harm. And I think the first reason that we need to be mindful not to stir up love before we're ready for it is because we have to be willing to admit that whether we're adults or grandparents or aliens from outer space, whoever you are, dating is always difficult. Whoever you are, as soon as you start dating, stress enters into the equation. In fact, while every couple in high school begins their dating relationship absolutely convinced that they'll go on to live together for 100 years, survive long distance in university, and then result in marriage with 15 kids or so, studies show that the average relationship in high school and, and junior high uh, lasts only between 6 and 12 months. Th that's it. And the reason that these relationships are so short-lived is because all of us, all of us who are at this age of being a student, of being in middle school, or of being in high school, have a general tendency of doing something not wise. And that is that we follow our hearts instead of our minds. We follow our hearts instead of our heads. And what do I mean by that? Well, I have a cute little cartoon up here for you. Um, you guys have probably seen some illustration joke of, of this some, on the, this level somewhere or another. But unfortunately, this is a thing that young people have to deal with. We have a very strong habit as young people to be willing to act upon emotions without considering the other components that make up a good relationship. If a person is cute or good looking or if they pay special attention to me or if they're popular, the truth is that as a young person, I'm, I'm willing to overlook those things and say that these will contribute to a stable relationship. And on top of that, it means that we're willing to overlook the negative qualities, such as a bad temper, no common interest, or total lack of maturity. And being willing to overlook the negative things can end up leading us down a road that is quite dangerous to our emotional and mental well-being. Specifically, it leads us down a road of spending an unbelievable amount of time sacrificing ourselves, even to the point of tears, feeling guilty and trying desperately just to keep a relationship going with someone who was so bad for us. That is the consequence of using our hearts instead of our heads. And you've all seen this, haven't you? In fact, my brother, uh, when he was in high school, he dated. I didn't. No girls would talk to me. <laughs> for some, some reason, my brother had game, and I didn't. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why. His first date was like in third grade, I think. I remember her name was Jenna. <laughs> they went to the movies together and bought popcorn. They shared the bucket. It was cute. <laughs> uh, but my brother dated in high school, and the girl that he dated at the time, I'm sure she's nice now, but at the time, absolute train wreck. <laughs> absolute immature train wreck. Um, like I said, I'm sure she's nice now, so if you're watching this, <laughs> I'm not saying anything bad about you. But I remember specifically my brother on the phone all the time coming home, on his phone, screaming at his girlfriend or begging her for more attention or crying because she dumped him or angry because she did something or confused because she said he did something. Up and down, up and down, up and down. We've all seen this. Expecting unconditional love without even knowing how to offer it ourselves. These are pure signs of what it looks like to stir up love before love is ready. We are not capable of understanding what love and relationship commitment is or not capable of understanding what makes a good relationship and we're willing to overlook all the bad stuff in order to attain the things that don't actually contribute to a good relationship. And it is this instability that is so characteristic, so characteristic of, of youthful relationships 
that causes, listen to this, instability in relationships cause the main and most documented reasons for depression, for stress, and low self-esteem amongst young people. Most depression and most emotional trauma in young people comes in one form or another primarily because of either a failed or a stressful romance relationship. We need to be careful that when we stir up love before it's ready, we don't stir up depression with it. This is a huge thing. It's a real phenomenon. But it's not just because of the emotional difficulty that we need to be careful about not stirring up love before it's ready. I'll, I'll, I'll try to use euphemisms here for you, but the fact is that when we date, we are entered into a great realm of sin and temptation, aren't we? I don't have to be very vivid because I think you understand. But at some point during a relationship, the discussion of physical touch enters the relationship. Should I kiss? Should I spend alone, uh, time alone with them? How far will I go? I'm sure I don't need to describe. But let's be honest, the one who dates faces a whole different world of temptation that their non-dating friends will never deal with. And while I'm sure that there are many emotions and feelings for love for your partner if you date, I have to tell you honestly that there is a great deal of struggling, guilt, and running away from God that often accompanies people who try to date before they're ready for it. I'll be very honest with you. I'm not here to shame anybody. I'm not. I'm not here to shame anyone. But those of you who date and try to make church fit in your life together with your dating somehow, how has that impacted your relationship with God? Has it caused you to miss church because you're ashamed of something that you did? Or have you lost interest in God because he calls you to be careful and mindful on how you act with the person that you love? Have you felt that you're at war against God? Have you felt that you're willing to spend time with your partner instead of spending time with God? I'm willing to bet that if you date and try to go to church at the same time, you, you know what I'm talking about. This is the danger. We can complicate our holiness and hinder our relationship with God if we are not careful with how we date. It can be as simple as, you know, I don't do anything I shouldn't do, but I'm even willing to miss church just so I can go on a date with my boyfriend or girlfriend. I don't plan on missing church tomorrow, but I was out late until about 11.30 last night, and I just don't have the energy to go to church. This is a real phenomenon. And most students who date find that their relationship directly contributes to some instability in their church life. Okay? I have to admit that other things are hindered. Schoolwork, extracurriculars, even quality time with your own family. Other things are hindered when we start dating. But the truth is that before we start dating, we really seriously need to consider and ask a question. Am I trying to date Am I trying to awaken love? Am I trying to stir up love before I'm even ready for it? Consider, please, if you can wait, if you can feel an emotion within you and say, nope, I'm going to put that away because this is so not my time for this, I will always support you in that decision. Always. If you're in middle school, if you're in high school, I will always support that decision. If it's possible to catch your emotions, please do. Because it will cause you, I promise, it will cause you confidence, it will cause you happiness, and it will cause you stability in your church life. So that's the first part. If you want to date, first understand, please, do not awaken or stir up love before it's ready. Okay, so that's the first thing. What did we just learn? Before you date, evaluate. Right, we, we can make bumper stickers out of that. Before you date, evaluate. Or maybe what your parents say. Before you date, graduate. Right? <laughs> Matriculate to law school. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I, I know a lot of times it's common for parents not to let their kids date or prefer that they date until they graduate with a master's degree. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I get it, right? Uh, the, the whole point is before we date, we really need to evaluate our situation. But let's just say that you're sitting there saying, but Pastor Jeff, you don't understand there's a fire burning within me, <laughs> right? And I can't contain this pure volcanic eruption of love, and I don't know how to, how to do it. And you're sitting there, and you're about ready to blow up because you're just so filled with love and passion. Uh, to you, I would say, okay, partially because I'm a romantic at heart, uh, but partially because, as Scripture said, there, there's nothing in Scripture that actually forbids dating, uh, this, this is between you and your parents and God about whether or not it's time for you to date. But if you do decide to date, I have this principle for you. If you date, date with Christ in mind. Date with Christ in mind. Now, this was meant to be a joke. <laughs> um, I, I, I so don't think that's what they're thinking about. <laughs> but um, you get what I'm, where I'm going. If you date, you got to be dating with Christ in mind. Let's take a look at our scripture today. Our scripture says, and whatever you do, this is Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving him thanks to God the Father through him. And that limits us, doesn't it? Because what this means is that this is telling us that while the world proclaims that dating, even for people as young as middle school, they say that dating is something that helps us grow and provides us a place for emotional experimentation, Christians, Scripture says, are to hold themselves to very different standards than the world. It's just our lot. That's what we're responsible to do. Simply put, if we're to date... Or to date in a way that pleases God. I was telling Pastor Eric I wanted to make this section, if you date, date as if unto Jesus. <laughs> but he said that that sounded weird. <laughs> so we'll just put it this way. If you date, date with Christ in mind. Date in a way that pleases God. The truth is that Christians are called to have every aspect of our lives, whether waking or sleeping, or word or deed, everything we're to do in obedience to our creator everything and therefore if we date we must date to please him in fact funny enough this passage isn't uh, exactly applied to dating very much uh, but if we look at the next verse in colossians 3 18 uh, it goes from saying do everything as if to god and then it goes on immediately saying how Christian wives and husbands should love each other. So this passage very directly tells us that we are to take our romantic relationships and treat them in a way that is not contrary to the way that God wishes. And so if you say, Jeff, come hell or high water, you can't keep me away from that boy, <laughs> right? Um, okay, right? Or if you say, my love is so big it's going to burst out of my chest, I say to you, okay, really, I, I, I'm, I'm here for you. But let me share with you how best to date in a way that can honor your relationship with God, okay? So I have, I think, four principles here. And the first principle that we have is this. First and foremost, if it, you have decided it's time to date, never, never, never hide it from your parents, please. Never, never, never. I know some of you probably have parents that wish that you won't date until three weeks after you're married. <laughs> okay? I know. It's hard to do. <laughs> it's very rare. Uh, now, believe it or not, I've actually been to weddings where that was the case. <laughs> you think I'm nuts, but it's true. Um, I've been to weddings where they didn't date. The guy just walked up to one of his friends and said, will you marry me? And then they got married, and then their dating relationship started after they got married. So, <laughs> very weird. Uh, it worked out nicely for them. They're actually, uh, no, they're back in Japan. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, weird. Uh, that's not normal, <laughs> so I get it. Um, but for the most part, if your parents refuse to let you date, I got to tell you this, regardless of their reason, it's a very, very bad idea to try to date and then hide it from them. 
oh man, is it a bad idea? Uh, first and foremost, because when you disobey your parents, you are in direct violation with uh, our verse, uh, Colossians three seventeen, and then three twenty. In fact, Colossians three twenty says this: Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. What does this mean? It means that if you date against their will, plainly you are in sin and you displease God, and God will not bless your dating relationship. If you date to hide your relationship from God, God will not bless that relationship because you are in sin. That's a bad place to be. But what's more is that, I got to tell you, if you try to date and then hide the relationship from your parents, man, there's a tremendous amount of guilt and paranoia that gets muddled in with that. Uh, In fact, I once had a student who tried to hide her boyfriend from her mom, and I caught them. Oh, man, it was great. <laughs> I was at TGI Fridays on a date with my wife, and here she comes in, and she does this whole thing. She goes in, she sees me, whoop, and she just walks out of the room, and I knew exactly what she was doing, and then she went across the street, grabbed one of the older ladies from our, well, not older, she was like 20, but um, she, she was one of our youth assistants, uh, grabbed her, and then brought the youth assistant with her boyfriend, and then her all together, and tried to pretend like they were having like a friend <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was pretty funny on my part, but man, it was horrible for her. Caught instantly, instantly afraid, instantly paranoid of who does know and who doesn't know. Fear that mom and dad might find out, which they always do. There, there's no way to fix that kind of situation. There's not. If you start dating before your parents give the approval, or if you start dating against your parents' approval, they will find out. And when they find out, there's no way to make it so that they find out in a way that makes everybody happy. Everybody's going to get hurt. Everybody's going to lose trust. And I promise you, you will be in tears. Really, my advice to you is that if you date, make sure that your parents approve. Do not go against your parents' advice here, okay? That's the first thing. Second principle is this. If you date, please make sure you date a believer. Please, please make sure you date a believer. I know that unbelievers are funny. I know they're outgoing. They can be very sexy. And there's some excitement because they have a different worldview. And they're not at all shy about sharing their affections with you. I get it. It can be very intoxicating with that raw emotion. I've been there. After, uh, no, when I was in seminary, um, I had a really, like, almost serious relationship with a girl who didn't even believe in God. It, 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 it can be very intoxicating. But Paul tells us directly that if we're tied to somebody, we need to be tied to them equally. And what that means is we find this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, where I'll summarize it. It says, Do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. For what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness, and what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? The short of it is this. If you tie yourself to someone who is not tied to Christ, you will be unequal in all of the most horrific ways. Okay? I'm not talking merely about having a different morality. I'm not merely talking about the fact that, oh, but they're going to tempt you because they have, uh, you know, they don't think that, the things that you think are wrong are wrong, right? They want to go farther with the relationship, but you're not ready, but they don't care because it's not wrong for them. That's a thing. We're not going to talk about that today, but that's a thing. But there are even deeper problems than that, if you can believe it, because I want you to seriously consider this. If you are in love with Christ, the person who you love will never understand. They will think, oh, your faith is important to you, or, oh, my boyfriend is really religious. But they won't think to take it further than that. The truth is that you will be tying yourself emotionally to be in love with someone who does not understand your priorities, who will be jealous of you for choosing God over them, who will maybe, I'm emphasizing maybe, they may even blame you for not wanting to take the relationship as far as they want. And always, If you date an unbeliever, you will be in the constant fear of worry because you know that if they die, they will go to hell. This is a thing. 
you don't think it's a thing when you start dating them. But it becomes a thing very quickly. I mean, in fact, there, there are people probably in our church who have married unbelievers. There are people who you know who've probably married unbelievers. Maybe your parents did it. Maybe one of your parents is a believer, and they married an unbelieving person, and that's one of your other parents. And I want you to ask them what it's like. Do they have a good relationship? Yeah, it could very well be. Are they happy together? Yeah. Are they in constant fear and worry and terror because they are afraid that their their spouse is going to go to hell? Yes. It is very hard to deal with that. If you date, Paul says you must choose a believer, period. Decide to cultivate that heart that if you should love, you will only love someone who loves Christ. Because with them, not only will you have hopefully lowered the level of temptation, but they will understand all the most important things about you. And they will seek to support you in the things that you find first and foremost important. They, they will want you to be holy that they will want to encourage you to be holy. This is the treasure of choosing to date a Christian. And by the way, that, that means no missionary dating. <laughs> All right? uh, no, do not flirt to convert. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> You're not allowed. <laughs> I, I, I promise you, it never works out. It always ends in pain. If you are to date, please, please, date a Christian, okay? So that's the second principle. Third principle is this. Set boundaries for holiness. I'll be honest with you. It's very disarming to date a believer who loves holiness. It's very disarming. It lowers your guard because you will put your guard down thinking that they want nothing more than to be just as holy as you do. (laughs) Only to find out that they're a person who struggles with the same stuff that you do and without being too graphic, I'll have to say that some of my biggest regrets in dating were not with unbelievers, but with believers who I thought I was safe with because, hey, we both want to be holy, and then I'm alone in a room with them, and then we find out, yeah, we both want to be holy, but we're also both really bad at self-control. You need to develop boundaries. Otherwise, what you do is you see a Christian, you think they're holy, You see the moonlight strike their face. You say how beautiful they are, and then you step on a landmine. (laughs) We're people, and we need to make sure that we're not naive about that. Christians, yes, but the flesh is weak. Oh, man, (laughs) trust me, I know. Set up boundaries so that you don't accidentally fall into sin, okay? Make sure that you choose that no matter what situation you're in, you will not be alone with the person that you're dating, period, Never alone in a room with them or alone behind a closed door with them or alone in a car with them or alone, you know, I I don't know, anywhere. Make sure that everywhere you date, you date in public because all the temptation in the world can't overcome the fact that you're always in public, (laughs) okay? I'm not going to try to decide whether or not uh, kissing is okay for you. I'm not going to try to talk to you about whether or not you think it's okay to, you know, h- how long can I kiss for? Are we allowed to touch hands? Are we allowed to do this? Are we allowed to do that? There's a whole discussion, and I'm not even going to go there. I'm just going to say this. Don't date in private, because all of the problems that come from this are easily solved, where if you're in public, you can't do anything wrong, <laughs> okay? It's simple, it's smart, and it protects you. And on that note, I'll say this, your phone. Make a boundary with your phone, too. Leave your phone in the kitchen at night when you're asleep. I know what this generation's like, okay? It wasn't like that when I was dating when I was a kid. I mean, this here was, you know, this wasn't even a thing. That's how old I am. (laughs) But I understand there are a lot of temptations that come from having a phone and a person who likes you on the other line at night. At night, take your phone and just lock it away. Get a physical alarm for five bucks at Daiso and then set yourself up for purity because your phone is in the kitchen every night from 10.30 to 8. It will keep you holy, I promise. And your parents will support this. I know they will. 
So what do you do in order to keep your relationship ready? Number three, set boundaries. And finally, the last one is this. The fourth principle for Christian dating is this. Be friends with repentance. And what I mean by this is make repentance your friend. I have to tell you that there is something I wish I knew when I was dating because I always felt in my heart that in my dating relationships, I was becoming so unholy before God that I could never be forgiven. Man, I struggled a lot. I I crossed all the lines that you shouldn't cross, okay? And it made me feel that no matter what I did, my relationship with God was just ruined because regardless of what I do in my relationship, I knew I was wrong. And I'm not here to say that dating is dirty. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is this. You're a sinner. (laughs) And if you date, there's a real good chance you're going to screw up. There's a real good chance you're going to mess up somehow. And if you're not careful, it will ruin you. So to protect yourself from that, you need to know what repentance is. The truth is that God says, regardless of what you do in your relationship, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says this, My little children, I am writing these things so that you may not sin, but what? But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Let me tell you, if you date, you, you will. You will feel unrighteous in your relationship at some point, probably. And how you deal with that is so important. If you're weak, you're easy prey for the enemy. He will make it his lasting pleasure to send you down the road of feeling like you've committed sin and that God no longer will forgive you of anything, right? And then that the logical conclusion is that, well, God won't forgive me, so I might as well just continue and continue and continue in violating my relationship. You need to know what repentance is. God says whatever your sin, you can go to him and you can turn around and you can gain forgiveness, okay? You are not a dirty, ugly useless, ruined person because of something you did in your relationship with somebody. Not possible. You can be forgiven. But you have to know how to repent. Know repentance well, and God will show you forgiveness. The truth is that God wants us to dedicate all things to him, including our finances, including our time, including our fantasies and our words, and yes, even our romantic relationships. And these principles, I hope that you can understand. Uh, To recap, uh, do not stir up love before you're ready. If you can wait, just wait. But if you can't hold it any longer, make sure that first and foremost, everything you do, you date as if you date for Christ. And trust me, there there are so, so, so many more principles that we just do not have time for, okay? Maybe next time we can have like a more principles for dating, right? We, we, maybe we'll do that next month. But until then, please understand this. Everything that we're called to do, we have to do as an absolute act of worship to God. And if you decide it's time for you to date, and if you talk with your parents and they say it's time for you to date, it's okay for you to date, and if you find a nice boy or a nice girl, I will support you. Oh man, I'm here for you. I'm on your team on this. I'm not here rooting, hoping in the, in the court. Oh, man, I get to be that goblin pastor that hopes their relationship breaks up. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to pray at night. Oh, and Lord, we just pray that, you know, Arnold and, 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 and Rosalie that just crush their relationship you know, <laughs> for Jesus. Right? I'm not doing that. I think that this can be an opportunity if, it, if it's agreed upon between you and your parents, that this can be an opportunity for you to grow and, and learn what it's like to worship Christ in a romantic relationship. You can do it. But we have to make sure that we do it properly. And so, as we try to make our relationship a relationship that's spiritually pleasing to God, let us remember what our Paul says in Romans chapter 12, and we'll end with this verse. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Dating is not sin or gross or evil or wrong, I don't think. If it's done correctly, it can be spiritual worship to God. 
Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for giving us, jokingly, I want to say, for giving us boys and girls who are cute and capture our attention. But Lord, you said that, that that's actually the reason that you gave them to us. That's exactly the reason why there's people that we can be romantically interested in. We, we look at how you created Adam, and then you said, it's not good that you don't have a wife. And then you gave him a wife, and the first thing he said was, this is awesome. <laughs> Lord, we, we can't hide this. We're not, we're not monks that lock ourselves away and never, never, never allow ourselves to be emotionally stirred to romance. We're people. We're people with raging emotions, but we're people. And Father, in this we pray that we can take dating, a very serious, serious part of our life, and that we can learn to dedicate it to you. Father, help us to live by these principles as an act of worship, and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and re respond. I don't know. I was going to say, let's go ahead and respond in praise. <laughs> um, yeah, we learned something, I think. And so let, let, let's praise God, and then we have some announcements for you. of all the earth, I care to know my name, I care to feel my hurt, who am I, the bright and morning star, I choose to light the way. Because of what I've done, but because of who you are, I am flower quickly fading here today and gone tomorrow. The waves toss in the ocean, vapor in the wind. Still, you hear me when I'm calling, or you catch me when. Well, uh, let's have a time of announcements. Uh, now, for students, stay. S stop. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. 
Uh, we do have some announcements for you. Uh, but for those of you who are new, um, welcome. Uh, if this is your first time here, uh, I don't normally talk about dating. I'm not that cool. <laughs> Our sermons are uh, Bible stuff. Um, but I try to do a topical sermon every, every month as we made the announcement. So um, we'd love to get in contact with you. And if you can go ahead and take a picture of that QR code or there should be a description in the link. Sorry, a link in the description. Um, and basically you can fill that out and let us know who you are and we can get in touch with you and follow up. Next, uh, Good Friday is next week. It's uh, going to be a live online service on YouTube uh, starting at 7.30 p.m. We will send the link out to you. Just follow the YouTube channel, okay? Follow this YouTube channel, and then at 7.30 next week, you will get a le- link releasing the, uh, the service, okay? So um, stay posted on that. Also next week is Resurrection Sunday, um, or for those of you who like the other word for it, we say Easter. Uh, April 4th is going to be our Easter service. It's going to be a combined service at 10.30, okay? No Sunday school. No Friday night worship that week. Everything's off. Just show up to Friday night, uh, Good Friday service, which is that guy, and then show up to Sunday at 1030. You get to sleep in a little bit um, for church. And then, yeah, it, it, it's combined. So when I may mean everybody's in it, I mean everybody. Chinese side, English side, children, youth. May, maybe we'll find some people off the street and bring them in. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the whole church thing, though, so I'm, I'm really excited for it. Um, and then finally, we have some prayer requests. Uh, I talked with Roger's mom. He said that surgery went well, but they found that this the cancer has spread, uh, and Roger confessed to me that he was pretty disheartened w- with the situation of his mom. So please keep praying for her. Uh, pray for her recovery. Ro- Roger's just decided to stay there until she recovers, so... Um, Pray for him as well. He's he's trying so hard to work overseas, and he's in Taiwan, but he's keeping like a Los Angeles time thing. So at like one o'clock in the morning, he starts work or something like that. So um, p- please keep him in prayer. Uh, pray for recovery. I also want to continue to pray for Joy's father, Jay, after his heart surgery. I live right next to them, and I saw him kind of out in the street uh, walking around, and I saw him in his car. Uh, I think he was backing up the truck or something like that. So he seems to be doing well. Um, Caroline, his wife, says that he's doing well, so we're so thankful for that. Uh, pray for the COVID-19 recovery and community. Um, vaccines, I don't know if you saw, starting on the 1st of the month, everyone who's over 60, right, Pastor Eric? Everyone over 60 is allowed to get vaccines starting on the 1st, and then at the 15th, 16 and up? Something like that. So it's time. So if you're qualified, and um, if you decide between you and your doctor and your mom that you want, and your dad, of course, probably, <laughs> no, just my mom, uh, if you decide all together that it's time to get a vaccine and you guys want to do it, we encourage you to follow that advice and um, stay safe. And finally, just pray for more opportunities to seek each other out. If you want to get access to our Discord, go ahead and let me know. We have one. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's it. Let's go ahead and do our doxology, and we'll get you out of here. God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below, praise Him above the heavenly host, praise Father, Son, Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for love. By love, we learn who you are. By love, you, sh- you tell us that we learn how Christ loves the church. And through love, we are sanctified. Love is awesome. And thank you for giving us the ability to experience it at a young age. Please, we just pray for the tools to be able to deal with it properly. Lord, we love you. Help us to make all of our love about you and dedicated to you. And Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Until we see you next time, and remember next week's a combined service at 1030. 
So two weeks. Um, and until we see you two weeks from now, uh, God in his peace be with you.